Hi, welcome to the first class in the Functional Lifestyle Series, Think Right, Harnessing the Power of Your Subconscious Mind. My name is Kim Z. Self, and I will be your presenter today. And I am so excited to dive into this class with you because mental emotional processes are one of my favorite topics because of how powerful they really are. There is a reason why this class is the first in our series, because really and truly, you can eat a healthy organic diet, exercise daily, prioritize sleep, take your supplements, but if you don't address your thought patterns or your emotional traumas, your body will reach a cap. You will never fully be able to heal. So that's why we've positioned this class at the very beginning. This quote summarizes it perfectly with your body can change your mind and your mind can also change your body. It is a two way street. It is very bi-directional and we'll talk more about what I mean by that today. So today we'll get into, we'll discuss how thoughts become reality. The fact that thoughts really are things, right? They're not just kind of these ideas swirling around in our head. They are physical things. So we'll talk about what that means. And um, we'll do a brief description based on physics. And then we'll get into um, quite literally how thoughts become neuropeptides and influence our genetic expression. Then we'll get into why we think how we think. Um, how pre, you know, perception is everything, how our programming, our mental programming, subconscious programming actually starts in utero and then moves into, into childhood and then into adulthood. And then we'll spend a lot of our time talking about how to reprogram the subconscious mind so that it's working for us, not against us. And then I'll end as usual with a few helpful resources if you like this topic and want to continue learning. So Thoughts, you know, we, I've, I've often described inflammation as being, or I, I guess really I should say that you've probably heard that inflammation is at the root of all disease, but that's really only half of the story. Inflammation is the immune system's response to injury. It is a normal, healthy response, in other words. Injury is what is at the root of all disease. And we know that there's three different categories of injury. We see there's physical stress, and I'm gonna use the term stress and injury inter interchangeably today. We see that there's physical stress, and that would account for, you know, acute injury, break a bone, sprain an ankle, um, traumatic brain injury, like a concussion, for example, is very significant, scoliosis, arthritis. Then there's chemical stress, and that's what a lot of us are working on, which would include um, toxicity, food sensitivities, hormone imbalance, nutrient deficiencies, things along those lines. And then there's emotional stress. And that's the reason I put this in here to really highlight the fact that our mental and emotional patterns very much contribute to our overall health and disease. So psychological stressors, um, residing, you know, ruminating over the past, stressing ourselves out with my, worrying about what might happen in the future, self-deprecating thoughts, emotional traumas, all of these kind of invisible, if you will, factors nonetheless contribute to our overall inflammatory load and the progression of symptoms and disease. And the inverse of that is true as well that by really becoming mindful and tuning into our subconscious thought patterns and replacing them with positive patterns and positive thoughts and higher vibrational thoughts that can, that actually do align with our goals and where we're trying to go can flip that switch so that our thoughts and emotions are working for us and not against us. When it comes to health and healing, your belief in your ability to heal and your trust in the process is paramount to your success. I cannot emphasize that enough. So if you take two people with, we'll just say identical people with identical health concerns, identical problems, identical histories, 
And one goes into this feeling excited and engaged and motivated and believe in the possibilities. And the other goes into the healing process, you know, doubtful, questioning, skeptical, the two are going to get very different outcomes. As I often put it, I can give you all of the kale salads and all of the nutrients and all of the guidance in the world, but if you don't believe in what we're doing, it's only going to take us so far. Okay. So how thoughts become reality? This is a brief introduction to physics because it's, it's worth really mentioning, you know, what we're all really comprised of. So introduction into physics, our bodies are comprised of atoms, just like everything in the universe is comprised of atoms. When atoms accumulate together, they create molecules. When molecules accumulate together, they create tissues. And when tissues accumulate together, they create organ systems. And then we have the entire body, right? And just like your body and everything that, are, that surrounds it in our environment seems like it's solid matter. And that's what we're taught in grade schools that there's solids and liquids and gases, which is all true. Um, however, at the most rudimentary fundamental level, when you're looking at an atom, an atom is actually 99.9% .9 space. So the Newtonian atom that we, we typically envision, you know, with the nucleus and the, the electrons surrounding it, and you can see the electrical, the electron orbital, it's not really an accurate depiction of an atom. Um, an atom is actually the electrons are basically, they, they take on a wave-like behavior and they all spread out. If you were to let one atom loose in a room, it immediately spreads out with this wave-like property and fills the entire room. One principle of quantum physics is that you can't actually exactly know where the electron is. They're all, electrons are, are potentials. They're possibility waves, okay? So I don't want to get too dense, but the purpose of this is the fact, again, that an atom is, you, you, the, the solid behavior of it comes from the rapidness that the electrons orbit the nucleus. Just like if you were to take a fan and turn it on high and it suddenly seems like the blades are all one, that it's all one blade. Similar idea occurs here in understanding that, you know, when you stop the fan, you then see that they're individual blades. It's not a solid movement at all. Same concept applies when we're talking about the atom. So further, um, getting into quantum physics again, there was a physicist back in the 1900s, de Broglie, who contributed to the, the formation of quantum physics as we know it, that I discovered that all matter is energy. So it used to be thought that only light was energy, right? Only light contains a wavelength. But then through de Broglie, it was understood that all matter contains a wavelength. And the greater the matter, the smaller the wavelength. So really what that means is nothing is, is really solid, right? There is, like everything at the end of the day is energy. It just depends on how quickly that energy is expanding and how quickly it's vibrating. So a good example of this is a, take a tornado, right? If you see a tornado, if you were to remove all of the, the dust and the dirt and the debris and everything from a tornado, you would just have invisible swirling gas, right? You wouldn't be able to see it, but nonetheless, it would be a force. That kind of gives you an idea of how the, the true nature of our bodies and really the entire universe, everything around us. Okay. So everything is energy. All matter is energy. And this isn't an esoteric idea. This is physics. So that includes our thoughts. Our thoughts at the, on the physics level are a form of radiating energy. We can actually measure those, which I'll show you in just a second. We can measure it through an EEG, um, electroencephalogram, or an MEG, a magnetoencephalogram, that measures the frequency of our brain patterns or our brain waves. 
And those can be detected outside of our body, up to a couple feet outside of our body. And there's different frequencies by which our thoughts follow. So I'll show you that later in this presentation. Um, but there's different frequencies, and those different frequencies affect our bio biology in different ways. So we have higher frequencies and we have lower frequencies, and they affect our biology in different ways down to the genetic expression. Similarly, external energy. So take, um, for example, EMFs, electromagnetic frequency, or the uh, magneto frequency from the earth, that it's electromagnetic frequency that's emitted from the earth or from the sun, different frequencies, it's very well known, affect our biology in different ways. And thoughts are no different. So thoughts are signals that are broadcasted outside of our heads into the environment, as well as the, the environment that is our body, and responds to signals from the environment as well. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, these can be measured through EEG and MEG devices um, that can measure the frequency of these thought patterns. And these signals influence cell behavior, genetic expression, they influence our immune system, our hormones, our heart frequency. There's actually a, another brain called the cardiac brain that resides in our heart. Um, they alter perception and mood and behavior. And we'll get into that more in depth in just a few minutes. In addition to frequency, to electromagnetic frequency, thoughts are also things. So what that means is every thought we have is changing, physically capable of changing the structure of our brain by creating new neuronal connections. And that's really how thoughts happen is by nerve cells, also called neurons, making new connections to each other and through different in different parts, different regions of the brain. And just like if you take a wagon and roll it over the same spot over and over and over again, it becomes ingrained. Same concept applies with essentially memory or habit or repetition is repetitive action, repetitive thoughts ingrains these neuronal connections, making the thought or the belief stronger and easier. That's part of why you don't have to think anymore when you ride a bike or when you drive a car because those neuronal connections are so strong, are so strong. Now, nerve impulses travel at a roughly 270 miles per hour. So the tone of a thought can affect our physiology almost immediately, right? And we've experienced that. Somebody jumps out in a dark alley, you have a fearful thought and boom, you elicit, you know, adrenaline. You don't even have to think about it. Or if somebody sends you flowers and you see the flowers sitting on your desk, instantaneously you're filled with love just from the instant thought of, or, you know, image of looking at the flowers. Okay, so it can change our physiology almost immediately. And here's the exact pathway by which that happens. So thoughts become neural networks, or I should say thoughts are produced by neural networks. These neural networks, like I just described, nerve cells communicating with other nerve cells, these neural networks release neuropeptides, which are also referred to as neurochemicals or um, neurotransmitters. Those neuropeptides then bind to our cells throughout the body and the brain, bind to our cells through cellular receptors. That creates, that sends, or I should say initiates an epigenetic signal to the cell of the body. That epigenetic signal then travels to the nucleus, where it then activates DNA selection and regulation, which leads to the expression of proteins. Proteins are things. Proteins are then what trigger the change in our physiology, so change in cellular behavior. And this can promote disease or health. That's part of why there's both a placebo, which we're all familiar with, where our thoughts change our health favorably. And there's also what we call a nocebo, which is less well known. Um, but nocebo is just the opposite, where our thoughts and beliefs change our health negatively. And this is the pathway by which that occurs. Now, the power of positive thought. 
And I want to make this really, really clear up front. When I talk about positive thought, I'm not saying we need to be happy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our entire life, right? That's not reality. We need to be authentic. And what I mean by that is taking the time and doing the work. And I'll have some tools at the end of this to, to, sh to really show you how this can be done to tune in to what those subconscious thoughts are. And if they're, they're old, outdated belief patterns that we very well might have picked up from childhood, from just passively observing others, now is the time to really start reprogramming those thoughts. Because first of all, they're rarely true. And second of all, they have and they really do affect us negatively. And so while this will be a conscious activity at first, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, the subconscious mind learns through repetition. So re by repeatedly practicing to override our self-deprecating thoughts, we can transition ourselves to live in a more positive default state, if you will. Okay. And then we just respond to life events accordingly. So it's fine to have darker emotions. It's fine to have harder days. It's fine to have negative thoughts, but where do you live, right? Where do you reside? What is the theme of your self-talk? That's really what I'm talking about. Okay. But I did want to highlight what some of the research is showing about the power of positive thought, that this isn't just all in your head, right? So this is coming from the Mayo Clinic. Um, showing that some of the health benefits associated with positive thinking, um, it actually increases lifespan, lower rates of depression, kind of obvious, um, greater resistance to the common cold. The reason they're saying that is there's ample evidence showing the positive influence on the immune system. So positive thinking actually enhances immune function. There's bi better psychological and physical well-being, reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease better coping skills during hardships and times of stress. And part of the reason during the hard times, the times of stress is because negative thinking makes us more sensitive to stress. Positive thinking, on the other hand, makes us more resilient. Here's some more information, more evidence, um, more research looking at the benefits of positive thinking. Um, so it improves overall happiness. There's evidence, again, showing that it enhances immunity. Um, everything from the likelihood of catching a common cold, the infectious agents, to overcoming cancer and chronic conditions. And then increased quality of life. And I loved this, the increased quality of life here too, that optimism predicted less disruption of normal life, distress, and fatigue in one study of women who were undergoing painful treatment for breast cancer. So this isn't negligible, right? Now, let's talk about some of the repercussions of head trash. First of all, what is head trash? <laughs> head trash is what I refer to, lovingly refer to as those self-deprecating repetitive thoughts that we all have. I mean, let's be real. We can really be our own worst enemy. We would never talk to our friends or our loved ones in the same way that we often talk to ourselves. And those are thought patterns that we've picked up. We didn't create them from nowhere. Those are thought patterns that we've learned and picked up over the years, largely in childhood, but passing on, I mean, our subconscious thoughts are formed in childhood through passive observation. They're formed also through very strong emotional events. And that becomes our inner voice. So what I'm talking about are thoughts like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not any good at this. I'm no good. I'm never going to be able to get better. I'm so weak. This is impossible. This is overwhelming. I'm so tired of this happening. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Those kinds of thoughts. Okay. And oftentimes they're, they're occurring beyond our conscious awareness. So it's just kind of, it's like playing a radio in the background where you're not really listening to it, but when you leave the store, that song is stuck in your head. Same concept with our subconscious programming. Oftentimes things that just kind of went on in the background and now 
sometimes years later, those thoughts are still going on in the background. We don't consciously tune into it, but nonetheless, they're, they're very significantly physically affecting us. And some of the ways that we see that is by through suppressing the immune system, increasing stress and hypersensitizing the stress response. So we actually see physical changes in the brain, looking at the subcortical regions like the amygdala and the hippocampus. And we see increases in the stress hormone cortisol and then ingrains a patterned neurological response. So going back to, we see, for example, um, the, the amygdala is where the um, very much our, our subconscious emotional processing occurs. And we'll see hypertrophy. We can actually see the amygdala size increase through chronic stress. Um, we'll see the hippocampus decrease, the size of the hippocampus decrease, or the size of the prefrontal cortex, which is more of our voluntary conscious thinking decrease. Um, so our brain is changing in a way that makes it easier for us to keep thinking this way. Because again, the name of the game with the nervous system is if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you want to strengthen it, in other words, neurons that wire together, fire together. So if you want to strengthen neuronal processing, do it more often. This was another quote um, looking at uh, just showing how thinking impacts us. So showing there's growing evidence that depression can directly stimulate the production of pro-inflammatory molecules that influence a spectrum of conditions associated with aging, cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, type 2 diabetes, and functional decline. Now, perception is everything right at the end of the day life events are all benign our mind is what attributes meaning to those events and if we attribute wrong meaning to something that is when the stress response is activated so for example you're driving down the road somebody cuts you off that event in and of itself is benign. Now we have a choice in that moment to either choose to believe, oh, that person, you know, that person must be in a hurry. I'm going to go ahead and back off a little bit because maybe they're in an emergency and they need to get, they need to, to move faster. Or we can tell ourselves that person did it intentionally to spite us. Now I'm pissed off. Let me rage, speed up and really, you know, give them peace of my mind. We're doing that all day long. And our perception of different events or emotions is influenced by our life experiences or our story, in other words, right? So two people come up on a similar event, but they have two completely different histories. They're gonna perceive that event in a completely different way. Now, the subconscious, those, those knee-jerk, thoughts, those knee-jerk reactions are dictated by the subconscious and they're rationalized by our conscious. And this is really what mindfulness is about. In order to reprogram your thoughts, your subconscious mind so that they're working for you and not against you, you first have to be aware of what you're thinking in the first place, right? So really practicing tuning in to what those subconscious thoughts are and then you can use your mind, your conscious mind, to choose to rewrite the script, okay? So our conscious mind, physically, it resides in the prefrontal cortex, really the outer layer of the brain, if you will. So what's right behind the forehead and then the outermost layer of the brain. Conscious mind is our most human brain. It was the latest to develop. It engages in planning, forecasting, logic, you know, calculations, and voluntary thinking. Okay, so me teaching this, this class right now, I'm using my conscious mind. The conscious mind can become preoccupied with daily lives and tasks and necessities and thinking about our to-do list and thinking about all these different things that we have. And we operate, believe it or not, we operate in our conscious mind only about 5% of the time. The subconscious mind, on the other hand, is far more powerful than our conscious. 
So when thinking about the physical structure of the brain outside of what's behind our forehead and just the surf, the most superficial layer, everything beneath that, what we refer to as the subcortical region or the uh, medulla, cortical medulla of the brain represents the subconscious mind. So we have the brain stem, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the pons medulla. We have many different brain regions. This is also what we refer to as a reptilian brain or the limbic system. Okay. This is where our involuntary thoughts, default pre-programmed behaviors, thoughts, and perceptions that are acquired from life experiences, this is where they live. Behaviors developed through passive observation, repetition, and significant events, same thing. And we operate in our subconscious mind 95% of the time. And I'll elaborate on that in just a minute. So the conscious mind, again, it's the result of neuronal processing in the prefrontal cortex, which is also the seat of our personality and reason, reasoning. The conscious mind is not bound by time. So the conscious mind is what allows you to recall past events and think about the future. Remember when that person did that to me or remember when I felt so good last time I ate that way. And gosh, in the future, I don't want to, I don't want to engage with that person again. And I really want to keep eating that way because of, you know, these, these associations and engages in planning and coordinating and reasoning. And I mean, it can process about 40 nerve impulses per second. Um, this is by in research referred to as the, the slow mind or the type two mind, if you will. The subconscious mind on the other hand is like I said, far more powerful. When we look at its computing power, it can process an estimated 40 million nerve impulses per second um, associated with the neural activity of 90% of the brain. Because when you think about it, most of what occurs in our body and what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, we're really not thinking about. We're not thinking about our breathing most of the time. We're not telling our heart to beat. We're not telling our intestines to digest our food. We're not controlling our blood pressure. We're not controlling our sweat release, right? We're also um, not thinking about when we're driving home. We're not thinking about going for a walk. We're not thinking about walking in general, right? There's a lot of things that we do that we don't think about. And so that is why the subconscious is so much more powerful and it's also much faster. So they refer to this as the type one brain, if you will, type one thinking, um, because it is so much more powerful. The subconscious mind is largely a playback system that possesses no creativity or sense of time. So that's why, for example, um, you smell a certain scent and you're just immediately transported back to the event that that scent is associated with that happened, you know, 20 years ago. Or you see something on TV and you're immediately triggered and respond with all of the emotions that are associated with that event from, again, 20 years ago. It's not bound by time. It's happening. Anything that subconscious picks up on is as if it's happening right now. Subconscious programming is the result of um, events that largely occurred in utero and childhood, as well as conditioned behaviors and strong emotional experiences. So briefly to describe that, um, what I mean by in utero and childhood is a lot of this is due to the brainwave activity that is unique to children. So we'll get into brainwave in just a second, but um, there's five different frequencies that uh, adults live in as far as brainwaves go. Children, on the other hand, really live in theta and delta frequencies. And those brainwave frequencies are essentially, you can think of them as more receptive, more malleable. Um, it's almost like a direct channel to the subconscious mind. When we talk about hypnosis, for example, meditation, the goals of both of those is to get you into a, a theta mindset, a theta brainwave. So children, that is part of the reason, a big reason why children, we, you know, we describe them as being sponges, right? It, it just seems like they're learning everything that they're surrounded by. And that largely has to do with 
the brainwave state that they reside in, that they live in, this theta brainwave state. So learning and development take place at warp speed during the first seven years of life. And the other part of this is the reason why none of the programming received before the age of six or seven came from our own wishes, our own desires, our own aspirations, but rather from observing others, our parents, our friends, our community, is because the prefrontal cortex, again, that cognitive part of our brain, hasn't developed yet. So children take things as absolutes. They don't have the ability to rationalize and see, for example, you know, oh, mom's mad at me because she had a really stressful day. And, and so she's really not mad at me. She's just, you know, needs to take out, take out that frustration somewhere. They don't have that ability. So rather, they just take things for face value. And that becomes their own internal voice, our own internal voice. So that can work for us and that can work against us. And realistically, most of us have a little bit of both, right? No, no parents, no adults are perfect. No child goes through this perfect childhood where there's no adversity, right? So most of us have a little bit of both. But nonetheless, becoming aware of those patterns is what's most important. So around seven to eight years old is when children acquire alpha wave states and they begin to be able to consciously rationalize observations like adults keeping in mind that the frontal cortex doesn't fully mature until about 25 years of age um, so there's still a lot of development that occurs but nonetheless that's where a lot of that programming is happening the other thing that i wanted to mention too is when I say that the subconscious can learn through repetition and strong emotional events. So repetition, again, think of learning how to ride a bike, learning to drive a car. If there's something, you know, in school, you go, you go to school and you study, it's that repetition that allows you to, to train it to become subconscious where you don't have to think about it. So repetition, repetition, repetition trains the subconscious mind. Strong emotional events. Um, we can all probably remember where we were when 9-11 happened, right? If you go through something traumatic, um, like a breakup or a car accident, for example, you will always remember the details of that event without having to think about it. Um, so that's where those strong emotional events are, you know, let's say that you've got a job promotion, same thing. It can be good or bad, but something that's very strong also. Um, penetrates into the subconscious mind. So when we're looking at these brainwave frequencies, as I mentioned before, there's five different frequencies. Um, starting from highest to lowest, there's only four shown here because gamma, gamma is the highest frequency and gamma frequency is actually associated more with um, intense focus on something. So we see gamma frequencies occur more in like transcendental meditative experiences. Most of us aren't really experiencing gamma on any, with any regularity. So working from the top down, on the right hand side, we see beta, which is the highest frequency. Then there's alpha, theta, and lastly, delta. Delta is occurring largely when we're in sleep. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unconscious state. So mostly when we're sleeping. Beta occurs when we're awake, normal, alert consciousness. So when you're at the office, when you're talking to your friends, uh, most of the time you're going to be in beta. High beta is associated with more stress response. High beta frequencies can stimulate the fight or flight mechanism. So that is associated more with like irritability, agitation, rushed, hurrying, frustration, Alpha and theta is really where the magic happens. And this is what meditation, um, biofeedback, this is what we're really trying to accomplish with these is to practice dropping down into alpha, particularly alpha, because alpha is a, you can, you can reside in alpha largely. It's possible to get work done, to get, you know, um, responsibilities done. But the beauty about alpha is it's more of a calm, relaxed, creative space. 
So you're being productive. You know, we, we commonly really refer to this as being in the zone where you're being productive, but not stressed, right? Not hyper-focused. Um, alpha, there's also your memory is better, your biochemistry, your immune system, your hormonal balance is better. Um, and you, you never really feel that sense of stress. You can tap into more of this intuitive, creative quality. And theta is very similar, but theta is um, the next level down. It's more associated with deep relaxation, very intuitive states, meditation. Theta is the state that you're in um, right before you're about to fall asleep. And uh, the one nice, the one really cool thing about theta, two things. One is, again, the, the subconscious mind is very impressionable when it's in a, a theta state. So we can harness that power by combining meditation with, for example, um, subliminal tapes. So record yourself saying something or find a guided meditation where someone's saying very positive affirmations. And if you to listen to that passively while in a meditative state, your subconscious mind is much more malleable to those changes. So that's part of the reason I, I encourage the use of the Muse meditation headband because it uses neurofeedback through the use of sound to help guide you into these alpha and theta states. So not only is that good for stress management and relaxation, but quite literally in the alpha and theta brainwave states, we're able to change a habit or change a behavior or change our subconscious thinking in about a third of the time as it would take as if we were just consciously trying to make these changes residing in beta. So our subconscious programming, again, is operating 95% of the time and is unconsciously creating the behaviors that reveal how we feel. So if consciously we're like, yeah, I'm totally on board with this. Like I'm going to eat healthy this week. But subconsciously you're like, no way, this is hard. What am I even going to eat? I guarantee you the week will come and go and you'll look back and realize none of those changes were made. Or it'll really feel like you're pushing a boulder uphill. So if you really want to successfully and permanently change behavior, we must change the subconscious mind. Now, the brain and the mind, really and truly, what it comes down to is what are you tuning into, right? We can choose our thoughts at any given time. Now, granted, they're influenced by our biology. They're influenced by sleep. They're influenced by hormones. They're influenced by inflammation. They're influenced by stress. They're influenced by all of these things. But with practice, we can gain even greater control over the power of our minds. So again, it comes down to what are you choosing to tune into? Now, reprogramming the subconscious. Reprogramming the subconscious mind starts with being conscious of what you want, being conscious of the behaviors and the attitudes and beliefs that you want to embrace. So ask yourself, literally, consciously ask yourself, what do I really want? What do I want out of my health? What do I want out of my life? What do I want out of my relationship? Start with focusing on what you want. Don't distract yourself with what you don't want because you'll just end up attracting more of that. Focus on what you really want. And I encourage you to write it down, okay? Write down on a piece of paper, bullet pointed fashion, what do you really want? and then put that paper somewhere where you can passively observe it. Next, review your subconscious programming. This is where mindfulness really comes in. Listen to your thoughts as they arise. And this requires you to slow down, right? If you have a, a knee-jerk reaction to something or a sudden emotional shift, pause and tune in to what that is. What are you really feeling and where did it come from? Next, answer the question, do my subconscious thoughts support my desired outcome? 
do your subconscious belief patterns, what you're thinking when you're driving, what you're thinking when you're walking, what you're thinking when you're not really thinking, do they align with your desired outcome? And if they don't, then tune in with the conscious thought and overwrite it. So start reprogramming. Again, everything that I described is summarized as mindfulness. So slowing down and allowing yourself time to reflect on what your thoughts and emotions really are. And then rewrite those subconscious thoughts as soon as you become aware of them. So if you go to a restaurant and sit down and realize that there's nothing on the menu that you can eat, immediately your subconscious mind says, God, I'm so tired of this. Like, I'm never going to be able to, to sustain this. This is a waste of time. Immediately tune into that and reprogram it with what you really are aligned with. So something more like, you know, these challenges come up, but I have no doubt that I'll find a way to overcome them. I believe in myself. I believe in this process. I'm feeling so much better. I can overcome these little challenges. Okay. Next, neuro and biofeedback. This is where I really like this because it makes it tangible, right? Thinking ourselves out of things can be difficult. Let's be real. So neuro and biofeedback devices like the Muse headband or the HeartMath HRV devices, they guide you through sound or through a stimulation into a calm state, thereby training you, just like Pavlov's dog, right? They retrain the stress response and our thinking patterns and our brain and physical functions, biological functions. So these are a really, really powerful addition to reprogramming our physiology to be in a more calm, coherent state. Regular use is important. So I advise at least a minimum of 10 minutes each day, the more the better. Next, hypnosis and subliminal tapes. Hypnotherapy can be very powerful. It's even supported by the American Medical Association. Um, the goal of hypnosis is to actually get you into an alpha and theta brainwave state where the practitioner then begins coaching you through um, your, your true goals, your true nature based on, on what you've shared. So they use guided imagery and specific language to access the subconscious. Something you can do at home though is subliminal tapes, use subliminal tapes. And this, what you can simply do is record yourself saying positive affirmations and speaking your goals into a recorder. I mean, you can even just use your phone. And then during your meditations, play that back. When you're in that alpha theta brainwave state, that calm, relaxed state, play that tape back. Don't actively listen to it. Just let it play in the background. And that is how you start tapping into the subconscious. Again, do it regularly. And I encourage right around when you're doing either your bio and neurofeedback or meditation for the day. And then lastly, practice and patience. Know that this takes time. It takes practice. And the more you're intentional about committing to this and the more you practice it and the more patience you have with yourself, the, before you know it, you'll look back and realize that you're really a completely different person mentally and emotionally. Okay. Repetition leads to habituation, which is how you change the subconscious mind. And that is what I will leave you with. So if there's more information that you would like that you're seeking, um, here's some of my favorite books. Um, they're really, really powerful books and resources for hypnosis and subliminal tapes and guided medita meditations. And uh, again, remember, our mind is the most powerful agent that we have. And believing in the process and believing in your abilities and your ability to heal trumps everything else. All right. Thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed this. Stay tuned for our next class, which is the Eat Right, the Good. It begins our Eat Right series in our next class. Enjoy.